I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss the extraordinary videos from Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner Group, who filmed himself in front of dead Wagner soldiers and blamed Moscow for a shortage of ammunition, even threatening to retreat from Bakhmut by the 10th of May. We also analyze how Russian state media is treating the alleged drone strike on the Kremlin and hear diplomatic updates from across the world. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 5th of May, one year and 70 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our Associate Editor for Defence, Dominic Nichols, Assistant Comment Editor Francis Durnley, Foreign Reporter Genevieve Hall-Allen, and former Tank Commander and Telegraph writer Hamish de Breton gordon I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi David, hi everybody. So, well, I guess it is Ukraine, but we're not exactly sure. There's a very, very odd video clip going around social media you'll you'll find it it's on our live blog at the moment on our website so you, you can have a look there so this is where well, it's purporting to be from yesterday and it shows our old chum Yevgeny Prigozhin head of the Wagner mercenary group he is standing in front of what he claims are the bodies dozens of bodies of Wagner fighters and he is directly blaming the Russian authorities for their deaths and linking it to a lack of ammunition. Now, I mean, he's done this before. He's he's spoken out before, but this is quite extreme. And there was another video yesterday when he was uh, not that graphic. He was in front of a load of his fighters and he was addressing the camera in a in a bit of a bit of a rant against the against the Kremlin. But I mean, he was specifically saying that the Wagner Group lacks, and he puts a figure on. It. He says seventy percent of the ammunition they need, and he appealed directly to Defence Minister. Sergei Shoigu and Valery Gerasimov, the chief, the chief of the general staff, the head of the Russian, the whole Russian armed forces. Well, head of the whole Russian armed forces, and and when he's got spare time, apparently he's running the war in Ukraine. But in this video, it, it's very graphic. The two of them together. So, like, I say the one from, well, well, the one that was released yesterday and and one today. There's nothing to suggest they weren't filmed recently, but we don't know when they were filmed. But it's quite graphic. The one when he's in front of the front of the dead bodies and you know there's a lot of potty mouth so beware of that but he put it put it on 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 uh, telegram and you know i, I mean it's, it's quite extraordinary what what he was saying i'm going to use the old hollywood trick of replacing the naughty word with the the word melon farmers apparently hollywood used to do that because your, your mouth makes the same shape if you say melon farmers as the as the actual naughty word but anyway i digress so Prigozhin was saying, uh, these are the guys from Wagner PMC who died today. Their blood is still fresh. We're 70% short of ammo. Shoigu, Gerasimov, where's the melon farming ammunition? Melon farmers, look at them. And then he, kept, he went on. He kept going on. He was, looking, he was very angry. Um, now listen to me, you melon farming bar stewards. These are someone's melon farming fathers and someone's sons. And those bar stewards who are not giving us any melon farming ammunition will be in hell munching on their melon farming insides. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. We know that there are there have been tensions. The relationship between Prigozhin and sort of Moscow centre, if you like, goes in fits and starts. One minute he's in favour, the next he's he's not. He's allied himself with Sorovkin, the uh, the general who was previously in charge of the war and is now just in charge of I don't know some bit some bit of it. But the, there's politics here, which I'll talk about. I'll talk about in a moment. But he, he finishes off. He says, "If you'll give, if you give us the normal amount of ammunition, there will be five times fewer of them." As in pointing to the dead bodies, and says they came here as volunteers. They are dying so that you can gamble in your redwood cabinets. Uh, it's just extraordinary. And then the the video from yesterday. He talks about um, he, he 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 talks about the bureau, the soft bureaucrats in the Kremlin. They're all turning to jelly and. I mean, right, he's he's pinned his colours to the mast, right? So there's long-standing tensions here, as we know, but this is on the back of... So against that against that background, but last weekend, he threatened to withdraw Wagner troops from Bakhmut if Moscow didn't provide him more ammunition. And he he's reiterated that, that position. 
And he's actually put a date on it. He said that they will leave Bakhmut on May the 10th if they don't get more, in particular, am, um, artillery ammunition. And he said May the 10th because he doesn't want to uh, doesn't want to embarrass Russia by leaving before you know, the Victory Day parade on the 9th, which is, hang on, can take my shoes off, next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday, Prigozhin. Anyway, he went on, I declare on behalf of the Wagner fighters, on behalf of the Wagner command, that on May the 10th, 2023, we are obliged to transfer positions in the settlement of Bakhmut to units of the Defence Ministry and withdraw the remains of Wagner to logistics camps to lick our wounds. Now, look, there's probably something going on in translation here, but but because lick our wounds sounds quite... It sounds quite sort of victim. You know, he's, he's inhabiting that uh, that role. I'm withdrawing Wagner PMC units because without ammunition, they are doomed to a senseless death. And he then added that they've fallen out of favour with envious near military bureaucrats. So oh, blimey, it's a, it's a bit of a download. But w- what's happening here? So, I mean, this is all very public stuff. Clearly, it's in the public domain. We are talking about it. He's not sending these messages privately. If he was... Yeah, I guess he is genuinely concerned about not having enough ammunition, but he's not making these points privately through the through the correct channels, although I might sound like a, a near military bureaucrat by talking about process here. But, you know, he's doing this publicly and that's got to there's got to be a reason for that. I mean, it is a very, very big call for him to say this stuff out loud. It's a political move. Yes, of course, it has battlefield impact, but this is a political move. And I just wonder if he if he's sniffing an opportunity here for some political favor of course the we can't ignore the the kremlin drone strike the other the other night we still no idea what's what's go, really going on there but there's a lot of stuff happening in the politics and i think this is an extraordinary intervention by prigozhin and and it'll be really interesting to see what the russian mod say about it and and we will watch with interest this this spat carrying on in in the public domain it's great separately There have been, well, there are reports of a second drone strike on the Ilsky oil refinery in southern Russia. So we now put yourself on the map. We're 100 k's east, southeast from the Kirsch Bridge. Now, that is that's reported to be the second strike in as many days. This is coming from TASS, Russian state media, citing the emergency services, says there was a fire there. However, another Russian news agency, RAI Novosti, are saying that the fire today was actually, it was reignited from the from the attack on Wednesday. So it was an attack on the drone strike attack on this place on Wednesday. And there are questions as to, as to whether or not it was hit again yesterday, or if the fire has, has reignited. There are no reports of casualties. But it continues this pattern, as we mentioned yesterday, of logistic nodes, fuel in particular, around the edges of Ukraine, some inside, but mostly mostly in Russia itself, actually, and the, and the, tr- the mysterious train crashes, these, these uh, logistic nodes deciding to suddenly combust. Now, finally, today's UK Defence Intelligence Assessment are saying that the recent uptick in incidents on the railway lines in particular has almost, their words, has almost certainly caused short-term localised disruption to Russian military rail movements. Now, they're saying on May the 1st, the train was derailed because of an explosive device. We're up in, in Bryansk now. So this is the, the region of Russia that borders Ukraine and Belarus. So kind of northeast, a couple of hundred k's northeast of Kiev. Explosive device detonated on the tracks on May the 1st. And then the following day, there were more reports of a second train being derailed in the in the same region. Now, OK, MOD, British MOD is saying it, it will cause short term localised disruption. So it's not this is not a game changer. Short term slash localised disruption, not 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 an end game. But but it's forming a pattern. And as we said, this is exactly the kind of thing you would want to do ahead of any counteroffensive in order to limit the the range of those the, the of the vehicles. Russian vehicles can only go so far if they haven't got fuel, clearly. And uh, and so you are limiting their freedom of movement and you're having to you force the Russian logistic chain to be even more exposed and, and open to interdiction from, from Ukraine by by deleting some of these uh, some of these fuel depots and the and the trains and, and all the rest of it. So really interesting operations going on there. But um, yeah and there'll be more of those I'm sure. I'll take a little pause. Thanks very much, Adam. Before we come to Genevieve, Francis, can I bring you in? You've got some updates for us on Russia itself and what's been happening in state media since this alleged drone strike uh, this week. 
Thanks, David. All Dom's talk of bar stewards makes me want to go to the pub, maybe after the recording. So I want to stay on the military theme, first of all, because I was reflecting yesterday that the question of who was responsible for the drone attack in some ways is less significant than the question of how it's going to be utilised by Putin's regime. And we are seeing today that it is being used predictably for maximum effect. So our Russian correspondent Natalia Vasilyeva has written an in-depth analysis on the decision by the Kremlin yesterday after our broadcast to blame the US for orchestrating the attack, which it said was carried out by Ukraine on their behalf. So the Kremlin said that the, and this was Dmitry Peskov, our old friend, the Kremlin spokesman, he said that attempts to disown this, both in Kyiv and in Washington, are of course absolutely ridiculous. We know very well that decisions about such actions, about such terrorist attacks, are made not in Kyiv, but in Washington. So playing up this this line that this is a war against NATO and that it's being orchestrated by Washington rather than this being a war against Ukraine itself, because of course that would be far too humiliating given the defeats that they have suffered there. Uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has also said this morning that the drone attack wouldn't have taken place without the knowledge of Washington and has warned that Moscow would respond with concrete actions. He's currently in India. And he said that without the knowledge of their minders, the terrorists from Kyiv would not have been able to perform this attack. So again, reiterating the same line. Again, predictably, on late night talk shows, on state television, pro-Kremlin commentators have been calling for blood. One hawkish member of the Russian parliament has said that Ukrainian leaders should no longer be on the face of the earth. Nothing stops us from doing it. All what we would expect, although I do think it is interesting as well that uh, Russian state television has not shown footage of the drone strike itself. So that's something that, of course, has been sh- all across Western media, including ourselves. But Pravda, Russian's best selling tabloid, has covered the attack as a front page story, but has tried to really da- downplay its significance and the threat that it posed and has refused to show the footage. They've said there are no victims or material damage on the Kremlin. And so this and the slow reaction from the Kremlin, I think it took them about 12 hours to pick up or start to cover the news extensively for after the attack, plus the authorities meddling with GPS signals in Moscow in an attempt to possibly prevent drone attacks, is leading some analysts to argue that it's actually unlikely that this was a Russian false flag operation as a result. Others disagree, of course, and we've touched on that yesterday and I'm sure we'll talk about it again later on. We will, of course, continue to monitor this story very closely. But staying on Russia, I also want to discuss a story by Natalia about Russian society. And this is an interesting one as well. So Russia's parliament is expected to crack down on gender reassignment in an apparent attempt to discourage young men from registering as women to avoid the draft. So despite a little bit of context here, I think is important. So despite the Kremlin's very aggressive stance against LGBT and transgender people. Russia still has a fairly liberal legislation that allows change of gender markers following a psychiatric examination and doesn't and doesn't require sex reassignment surgery. So this this clampdown though that's being talked about is partly, we know, due to the sort of quite profoundly conservative shift in the society be used by the war. So we've got one justice minister saying that it's now time to enshrine family man values in Russian law and uh, ruling out the possibility of somebody changing their gender purely by changing documents. But also a uh, we've got a member of parliament saying things that this is actually a direct consequence of the war. Many young people have approached private clinics to sign off on change of gender to avoid the draft because of the special military operation in Ukraine. And that, I think, is the main driver here if this bill is adopted and there's possibility it'll be adopted as early as May 15th. If it does happen, it marks another cultural shift happening as a consequence of the war. But I think the anxiety around this is less about the uh, cultural fear of transgender people but more about obviously what the impact of this potentially on on the draft and we've already reported of course in the past about concerns uh, around this the the draft and many many young people of course have fled the country in order to avoid being forced to sign up and fight in ukraine the last story i want to talk about is around a row that has erupted in the last 48 hours between ukraine and germany regarding the first planned visit of president Zelensky next week So Kyiv is threatening to call off this visit to Berlin after details of the high security operation were leaked to the press. Ukrainian officials are 
reportedly deeply disappointed by the leak, which they suspect deliberately contained highly sensitive information. A source inside the Ukrainian government told the German website T-Online that it is open to question whether the Ukrainian president will carry out his first visit to Germany since the Russian invasion started. Mr. Volensky's next movements, as I say, hang in the balance after these leaks, and they are extensive. I mean, they talk about the hotel even that President Zelensky would be to be staying at. So huge concern, understandably, and pretty embarrassing for, for Germany. Of course, they will be very keen for this meeting to go ahead and for this visit to go ahead. Another, and this is the final story of visit, issue sorry that's causing consternation amongst the more pro-Ukrainian commentariat in German society is around the decision by authorities in Berlin to ban Russian and Ukrainian flags from being flown near the city's memorials this weekend as people commemorate the 77th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. So in a statement, the Berlin police have said that the act of remembering as well as the respect for memorials and monuments must be preserved against the backdrop of Russia's current war of aggression in Ukraine. The war must not be allowed to spill over into conflicts or disputes in Berlin beyond the democratic discourse. Some feel that this is a rather poorly timed decision, some even going further and saying it's insulting in the context of the war. They feel that the Soviet memorials are themselves not necessarily something to be treated with this reverence, rather monuments to oppressors, even if the Soviets were fighting against the Nazis. I saw one tweet that was saying, those same soldiers raped 100,000 women during the Battle of Berlin. And of course, it's been very interesting registering the reassessment of such monuments as a consequence of this war. You'll remember many months ago, the extensive examples in Poland of Soviet monuments being removed. And I believe that's happened again this week, in fact. This is a hugely contentious issue and one that's likely, I think, your, your opinion on this is likely to be formed by your perception of these monuments and your perceptions towards these particular countries. For those in Germany who believe that the country hasn't gone far enough in its support of Ukraine, they're looking at this decision as an example of further weakness and capitulation to Russian narratives on the issues. For others, it's unrelated and the Soviet monument should be treated with a respect given the soldiers that were killed as a consequence of fighting Nazism. So whichever view one stands on, I think it's, it, 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 it's one that you have to hear the other side of the argument. But politics is all about perception, as I've said many times, and the timing of this, given the Zelensky visit is unfortunate if the German government is seeking to drive home its support for the Ukrainian cause. But more on that, David, as we have it. Thanks, Francis. Genevieve Hall Allen, thank you so much for joining us from the Foreign Desk. I know we've only got you for a short period of time. So what's been coming up at the top of the, the Ukraine live blog for you? What stories have you been looking into today? Hi, thanks, David. Yeah, just a few stories from the live blog today. I suppose we should start really with, with some, some pretty concerning news to come out of the Zaporizhia region concerning the nuclear power plant. A Russian official has told state news agency TASS that record high water levels on the Dnipro River threaten to overwhelm a major dam in southern Ukraine and, and damage part of, of that power plant. Renat Karcha, a re, an advisor to the general director of nuclear energy firm uh, Rosen Ergo Atom, said that if the Nova Kakhova dam did indeed rupture, the power cable line for for the plants, pumping stations would be flooded. Russia's control of, of the Zaporizhia nuclear plant um, in Energodar has been an issue of, of international concern since f Russian forces seized the area pretty early on in the war last year. Um, the surrounding areas have seen heavy shelling since early on in the war. And last November, following the withdrawal of Russian troops from Kherson, near, nearby Kherson, satellite images showed significant new damage to the hydroelectric dam. So this advisor, Renat Karcha, told TASS, and this is in, in quotes, this would create functional problems for the operation of the plant and risks for nuclear safety, that is, if the if the dam does become overwhelmed. A Russian-backed official in the region, uh, Vladimir Rogov, told REA Novosti that 
the high water levels could also flood nearby settlements. However, he, he, he did say the rainy season has passed, so there is hope that the water level in the reservoir will be able to stabilise. Interestingly, the, these comments are a significant contrast to what Ukrainian officials were saying back in March when they feared that the nuclear facility could face a shortage of water to cool reactors by late summer as Russian forces had let water out of a reservoir that supplied the plant. So ongoing tensions and ongoing kind of nervousness surrounding that power plant in such a crucial region in the war. Elsewhere, outside of of Ukraine now, but concerning Ukrainians and Russian representatives actually at a meeting of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Black Sea Economic Community. So this is taking place in Ankara in Turkey. And um, there was an incident on, on Thursday where a physical fight broke out between Russian and Ukrainian representatives. I mean, there's pretty remarkable footage of, of this incident, which you can actually see on, on our website. And it shows Russian delegation secretary Valery Davidsky marching up to an, his Ukrainian counterpart, Alexander Marikovsky, who was waving a Ukrainian flag. According to reports, um, Mr. Marikovsky was hoping to photobomb a video interview with Russia's lead delegate while, while holding the flag. Um, but uh, Mr. Stavitsky, the, the, the uh, Russian representative, snatches this, this flag out of the hands of the Ukrainian representative and and walks off, at which point the Ukrainian representative chases after him and and punches him and the the physical altercation begins. People have to intervene. You can hear somebody out of shot you know, shouting, it's it's our flag. So that's pretty pretty remarkable stuff to see on a kind of global global stage and just shows that tensions are, are not really being kept under wraps there you know elsewhere at the same event you, the ukrainian delegation stormed into a, a into a meeting and unfurled the can, ukrainian yellow and blue flag when a russian delegate was speaking and at another event a russian state duma member ola timofeeva um, addressed delegates while wearing a st george's ribbon which is seen by ukrainians as a symbol of russian aggression so this caused major consternation among the ukrainian delegation who ended up actually being ejected from the meeting when security staff trying to calm down the situation were pushed out of the way thanks genevieve could i just ask you to talk about one more story of course tomorrow in the uk is the coronation of charles the third there will be ukrainian representation at the coronation who's going Yes, so this is the news that Olena Zelenska, the first lady of Ukraine, is to attend the coronation on Saturday. This was confirmed late last night by the official website of the president of Ukraine. And actually, Ms. Zelenska was pictured standing on the steps of number 10 Downing Street yesterday with Akshata Murti, the wife of Rishi Sunak. She also met with the prime minister himself yesterday. According to this this press release, Ms. Zelenska thanked the UK for its support of Ukraine and actually, in particular, for organising the Eurovision Song Contest, um, which is another major event in the calendar alongside, obviously, the coronation. And she said, um, the inability uh, of the winning country to host this competition should be another reminder of to the world of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. But yes, this is, ma- you know, this is confirmation that Olena Zelenska will be among the many representatives of foreign nations at the coronation on Saturday. And just a note that we are going to be covering the coronation live here at The Telegraph on our website and YouTube channel tomorrow. Dom will be joined by Camilla Tomini and Gordon Rayner for that. So make sure to check it out tomorrow. Thanks very much for that, Genevieve. Thanks thanks for joining us today. Hamish de Breton Gordon, thank you for joining us. It's really good to have you back on. There's an awful lot to talk about. Would you, I mean, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the story that Genevieve brought us about the Zaporizhia nuclear power plants and the, the threat of flooding there. What, what is your take on that? Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon. And uh, yeah, great to be back on the pod. Very, very worrying, I think. There, just before we go on to the high water mark point, you, I'm sure it was covered in the Telegraph, I think earlier on this week, maybe Tuesday or Wednesday, that the International Atomic Energy Agency said that their people on the ground confirmed that the Russians had uh, wired explosives to several areas of Zaporizhia. So we've always suspected that but that that was confirmed by the the IEA so that sort of builds up the tempo it's 
you know, is is this part of some shaping operation? You know, the the Russians are telling us that a dam, massive dam, is potentially going to burst and, and overflow, which could have an impact on on Zaporizhia, could affect the cooling mechanism, could affect the power, which, as we've discussed before, without cooling and power, we could go critical in the reactors and also the, the spent fuel outside the reactors. And at a time when, I expect we'll talk in a minute about counteroffensives, the impact of an accident at Zaporizhia could have a profoundly negative effect on Ukraine manoeuvre to this counteroffensive. So again, it seems super cynical, uh, and I'm sure I, I discussed a, a, a similar si- sort of similar situation I had with the Peshmerga, the Iraqi Kurd military, when I was advising them in the fight with ISIS. When ISIS blew up a massive sulfur mine and put a huge contaminated cloud of sulfur dioxide, 400,000 tons into the air, and that went straight across the advancing Iraqi army and, and really stalled them and made them have to change their plans. So hopefully this is an entirely natural event that TASS are reporting. But, um, you know, I take what TASS says in the same sort of vein. This, the, I take the, the briefings of Chemical Alley back in the first Gulf War. He's sounding, I must say, the, the, uh, the Russian spokesman with his talk about um, the drone explanation is sounding very similar to Chemical Alley. So I think it's, it's something that we nearly, really need to watch very carefully. Myself and others have been calling for a UN demilitarized zone around Zaporizhia. And if the Russians were really concerned about safety and wanted to do the right thing, then they would help. But they don't and they won't. Thanks, Hamish. Well, let's go on to talk a little bit about this potential counteroffensive. You've been seeing all the same news that we have, these train derailments, oil depots in Ukraine, uh, in occupied Crimea, and in Russia going up in smoke. Um, what do you make of it? What's your, what are your thoughts? Well, I- interesting. I, I, Dom yesterday talked about shaping ops, and, and sh- shaping ops is how you prepare the battlefield, so you, it's advantageous to you. And Mike Martin I, uh, has written quite a detailed piece in the paper today, which I'll come back to. But just on the shaping of just a quick burst on the drone thing, because I think this is this could be part of it. And I had some very interesting discussions yesterday around the bazaars and, and just a couple of points on the drone thing. You know, if it was a US drone, we would see a, a fin in in TAS and, and in Pravda with the stars and stripes on it. If it was a US drone, that dome that's got a bit of scorch mark on it would no longer exist. So, and also we'd expect the US AMBO to go and pull his tabs in at the Kremlin. And obviously that hasn't happened. On the false flag piece, again, somebody who really knows how, how the Russians operate and Putin w- was telling me that this is really contrary to the way he operates, you know, he's a winner. He's a strong man. So for a, a drone to get through and, and do this, you know, is is inconceivable. You know, it's so well protected. And I know that you covered that. The third element, and, and we mentioned Prigozhin at the beginning here and what he's up to. Well, it's been suggested to me that the, the, the third and most likely option is either separatists or perhaps disgruntled Wagner people. And there are a lot of them, and Brigozin, you know, is very, very disgruntled. I understand from a drone expert that it looks like, you know, probably this thing was launched fairly close to where it went. Might have had some electronic countermeasures that allowed it to get through the the umbrella, as it were, uh, to create what it's created. So, again, this could be part of, of, of the shaping operations. But I think, you know, the, the shaping operations you've covered and, and that will happen. You, we, we appear to be getting to the right. All the, the moons are starting to align now. The weather, you know, training equipment. Again, things are happening w- w- with the Russians. I think w- what has struck me is that we know virtually nothing about what Ukraine is up to. This force that they have, have established, w- which, again, I think is a really good thing. And, and going on to the offensive itself, Mike Martin discusses a whole host of options here. You know, w- which one they'll take, I don't know. But I expect the plan would be, and you look at the maps that, that, that he's produced in the Telegraph today, you know, it's all, all about dislocation, 
getting behind the enemy, sealing them off, because you know, we really don't think they've got the ability to do manoeuvre warfare and move manoeuvre around this. We don't think the Russian Air Force, again, I think we discussed a few weeks ago, I had very interesting chats with people who know about these things. You don't have the ability to do sort of combined arms operation in any mass. So very, very interesting. And um, yeah, I think, and, and next week, you know, the 9th of May is pretty key for the Russians, might be pretty key for the Ukrainians as well. Thanks very much, Hamish. Well, we'll come back to some of that, I'm sure. Dom, can I ask for your thoughts on some of Hamish's points? But also maybe Hamish mentioned there the expression, pull his tabs in. Could you just tell us what that, what that means, Dom? Yeah, I think I know what Hamish means, having been on the receiving end of this on a number of occasions, all for crimes for which I was not responsible. I think what he means is when he says pull his tabs in, I think he means um, the ambassador, US amb- he was suggesting US ambassador would be called into the Russian foreign ministry for a for a dressing down for a you know one way uh, a one way conversation an interview without coffee as we used to call it in the in the military so yeah so basically put his tabs in put his put his heels together all that kind of stuff and uh, stand by with the yellow pages stuffed down the back of your trousers for a bit of a bit of a spanking as i say it it may have happened to me in the past but you know i was i was you know cleared of all cleared of all crimes Thanks, Dom. Could we talk a little bit more than Hamish and Dom about the Russian Air Force? We've had quite a few que- we've had quite a few questions from listeners on this about about their effectiveness, how they might be able to respond to any potential Ukrainian counteroffensive. What what do you both of you make of that? Well, if I jump in first, let Hamish have the more the more considered view. Uh, I, I mean, yes, this this is one of the ongoing anomalies with this war where where is the russian air force why have they not turned up they have been extremely reluctant to go forward of their own lines i.e to, to move forward of the protective umbrella that's that's given to them by any ground-based air defense assets when actually of course it, it works both ways the air should be providing support to the ground as the ground su- supports the air and I don't know, okay maritime does its own thing but you know they should each be providing an umbrella for the other and then moving forward accordingly but the the russian air force have not really been doing that they've 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 been staying over their own over their own areas either inside russia the big two left strategic bombers are launching their cruise missiles in russian airspace they're not going anywhere near ukrainian airspace russian air force assets the vast majority of them are are not going ahead of their forces in um, in the areas in ukraine they're currently operating in all of which means that you're just not you're just not going to get anywhere fast. Now, the the one caveat I'll say is that we've been talking recently, or I've made the point that the the Russian missile strikes across the country. I think, and I still stick by this, but I, I think it, I think it is it is a, an inefficient use of resource. I think if if Bakhmut and the Donbass is their priority, they should be using that what sparse ammunition they have, these precision guided munitions or drones or whatever they're using. They should be using it in that uh, to support that that main effort they've not been doing that they've been they've been scattering it around that i you know i have received comments and these are all these are really good well evidenced opinions that actually will maybe the documented apparent paucity of air defense assets from ukraine is the reason russia's doing this so that they are using up their stocks i you know i take that on board that is a very 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 valid point and thank you to our to our great listeners for making that making that point to me i just think that would have been valid maybe six months ago, but there's been an inflow of air defence assets to Ukraine from from external supporters for months now, and I think their stocks are are you know they might not be fantastic, but I don't think they're anything like what they were. You're now seeing, I mean, it's, it's generally most, if not all, missiles and drones aimed at Kiev are shot down, and the vast majority elsewhere are also shot down. Some get through, of course. We've seen that this week, and civilians are being killed in their dozens. Was it uh, at least twenty in in Hezon? Although to be, that was artillery. That was not um, that was not missiles or or drones. But you know, I'm not saying this isn't without cost. But I think the moment has passed really for Russia to be trying to to go after Ukrainian air defence assets. And even if they had been, then they'd not been doing it. They'd not been doing it piecemeal. If, sorry, they were doing it piecemeal. If, if they were using their air and missile forces for that end, they were they were just firing missiles at them and, and drones. They weren't using the the air force. So it, it all comes back to th- that original question. And Justin Bronk from Rusi, who we've had on here before, you know, the, one of the country's premier brains on air power, he wrote a paper months ago saying, "Where's the Russian air force?" And and, and uh, there's still no is no real 
answer for that beyond well they just they just don't know how to use air power effectively but hamish will have a more considered view thanks dom i i sort of absolutely agree everything you said and as fellow tank soldiers um or, or put me as a tank soldier commenting on air power um will will we'll certainly be be stirring the gin gin and tonics in the RAF club no doubt this afternoon but but um i have spoken to a few people about this and i think i think there's a massive psychological ops piece going on here and as we know the ukrainians are very canny and very good at this somebody told me that a lot of the ukrainian pilots know the russian pilots and are quite often speaking to them you know over the airways and t- telling them that that they're going to get shot down. I think the air defence thing is key and part of the psyops too. And everybody knows the Patriots now steaming around in Ukraine, and which is something that the, the Russian pilots would be concerned about. The bombers firing the cruise missiles from outside Russia, that seems sensible. But, but actually mixing it dirty at the coalface with, with dogfighting and, and, uh, and ground attack, that just doesn't seem to be happening. Again, it would appear that they just they, they can only fight in one season and two seas. So a couple of aircraft supporting each other, where actually, from what I understand, you need to operate aircraft more like tanks, mutual support covering each other and, and that sort of thing. The, the other point is that these MiGs, you know, these these are not five hundred thousand dollar tanks, which they've lost two, two thousand, two and a half thousand of. These are twenty, thirty, forty, fifty million dollar vehicles air vehicles and um the the russians just can't really afford to use them whether they are whether they're saving them in case that ukraine decides to push a bit further than the border who knows but i think the psychological pieces has sort of kept them on the ground the build-up of air defense absolutely key and uh you know the these pilots are not are not the sort of um the basic tankies and the basic infantrymen who we know are being thrown into the fight with virtually no training and equipment. These are highly intelligent, highly trained people who are probably making the decision, actually, I, I want my eggs and bacon tomorrow morning. I don't, I don't want to go and fly out of Ukraine and uh, end up in the ground there. Thanks, Dom and uh, Hamish there. Francis, um, there's been some interesting news coming through on our live blog. Can you talk us through it? Yes, David. Well, breaking news. The exiled mayor of the occupied Ukrainian town of Melitopol, or Melitopol as the Ukrainians call it, has cited reports indicating that Russian occupation authorities in the south might be preparing an evacuation in the face of a possible Ukrainian counteroffensive. Now, as I say, this is breaking, but I understand that Natalia is writing up as we speak. So this exiled mayor, he said on social media that local residents who are reporting to him that the uh, occupation administration in the towns around Melitopol in the Zaporizhia region are setting up the evacuation of local residents further away from the front line and are cutting escalation on the battlefield. And he's also reported general panic in the, in the town and long lines to petrol stations. Those working for the occupation administration are reportedly told to uh, telling people to stay at home in the case of explosions. And whilst there haven't been yet remarks coming out of the Russian-occupied authorities, I think we can probably expect some kind of rebuttal from this because this clearly is a significant story and will lead, no doubt, to some alarm that something quite significant is happening there. But as I say, David, it's a breaking story, so something that listeners who are hearing this a little bit later will no doubt want to check out on the Telegraph website. Thanks very much for that, Francis. Um, Dom and Hamish, any more updates from you? And and Francis um, as well, of course. Well, I would just say, just as we were talking about air power, there are reports yet to be confirmed, that, but there are reports breaking at the moment that on May the 4th, be with you, my son, uh, so what was that, yesterday? At 0240 in the morning, Kiev time, Kinsal, K- KH. 47M2 Kinsal hypersonic missile has been reported was shot down. So these are air-launched ballistic missiles. And the thing about hypersonics or this this family of vehicles is that they, they go so fast and their trajectory is generally so steep that it is extraordinarily difficult to intercept them. However, there are reports that one of them was shot down yesterday, very early in the morning. So there's debris that's been found in... Something was shot down and there's debris in Ukraine 
the warhead assembly of that debris matches that that's in the Kinzhal and other Iskander series of ballistic missiles. Now, if it, if that's true, that's that's very significant because we were told that hypersonics are the, ne- the next amazing weapon that you never that will get through anything. There will always be yeah, there'll always some will get through, but there, there's always a way in military technology of bringing stuff down. But if that if that's true, it was probably brought down by a U.S. Patriot system. It, it could have been fired in response to the the drone strikes in against the Kremlin. It would have had a it would have been a very big weapon very big blast if it had landed properly on whatever the target was so if this is a kentel hypersonic missile that's been shot down by a patriot that is that is very very significant but like i said that's breaking now and yet to be totally confirmed thank you dom and francis anything further from you hamish only only to to, to sort of add add a tiny bit to that we've heard a lot about escalation in the after the drone strike and that might well be it because as we've discussed before, I don't think Putin can escalate with his tactical nuclear weapons. And there was some there was some guff on on social media yesterday about uh, bombers being armed with with tactical nuclear bombs. But I think it had absolutely no credence at all. So that might be it. But I, I agree with Dom. I mean, this is hugely significant. This hypersonic missile that was going to destroy NATO has been knocked out of the sky by Patriot. Expect to hear a bit more of that, I expect, from from, from the uh, Ukrainians and the Western side, if this is the case. Thank you very much, Hamish, Dom and Francis. Can we move to your final thoughts ahead of the, the long weekend? I must say, actually, quickly to listeners, unfortunately, it is another you know, UK bank holiday on Monday after the coronation of King Charles III. So we will have a recorded episode, which we've already done, of, of questions and answers using the questions you send in uh, to our email. Dom, Francis and I have recorded about 40 minutes, I think, uh, for the episode on Monday. So do tune in there. There will be no live episode on Monday. It is another UK bank holiday. So Francis or Dom, would you like to start? What are your, what are your final thoughts? Well, it's a very brief one from me today, David, so I'm happy to go first. I'm, I'm conscious I've been a bit of a gloomster recently. And um, so I wanted to end on something a little bit more upbeat, which is we get many, many letters and emails from listeners saying how much they appreciate learning more about Ukrainian culture. And so that's something we've tried to, to bring to the podcast whenever we can. I just want to draw attention to a free course that's being offered from the Open University that is about, they call it an introduction to Ukrainian language and culture. Uh, It's about 25 hours, but it's been put together by academics who are experts in this field. And uh, I'll read a quote from the sort of brief about it. So this free online course is for everybody who's interested in finding out about Ukraine and its people and wants to get a first insight into its rich cultural heritage. It's also for learners who interact directly with Ukrainian refugees, for example, by hosting refugees in their homes and who want to bring bring what they have found out, their knowledge and experience to a space where they can engage with like minded others and can find and provide mutual support and advice. For those who don't know, the Open University, very distinguished university here in the UK, but as well as offering degrees that people are paying for that are sort of proper postgraduate degrees and things like that or undergraduate degrees that people can do remotely they also offer these brilliant free courses and you can sort of get a certificate at the end that says that you've completed it but it's mainly just learning for learning's sake and the innate pleasure tied with that so as i say for those listeners who are particularly interested in ukrainian culture and language highly recommend the open university and this course thanks francis well we'll put it in the show notes then so people can find it there dom nichols would you like to go next yeah, thanks. So again, since we've been on air, more breaking news, which ties into what we what I started with today. So there's reporting that uh, out of Russia that's saying that Colonel General Mazintsev, who is variously referred to as the Butcher of Mariupol, he was in command there for some time. Although it is debated whether or not he was he was a, in a logistic capacity when the actual assault was happening. But anyway, you'll see his name linked with the moniker Butcher of Mariupol. But Colonel General Mazintsev, who was recently sacked as the Deputy Defence Minister for Logistics, Russia's Deputy Defence Minister for Logistics, he has apparently been named as the new Deputy Commander of Wagner. Now, Wagner are not part of the regular Russian order of battle. They're not part of the normal Ministry of Defence organisation. So if this is true, it raises questions. Has he, has he left? And if so, is this a new political block forming, as we've, as we've said before, the many 
political machinations between Prigozhin and Wagner and uh, and the uh, the Russian military establishment. So is this is he is he is this a political move, or is Wagner being brought into the fold of the regular forces? And if so, what does that mean for Prigozhin's position? Because he's always been the outlier. He's always been the the, uh, the the maverick, the outsider. You know, there are there are machinations going on here. Um, I can't I can't believe if this is true. I cannot believe that this is in, is not connected, as I said at the very start of today's episode, with this bizarre video clip of Prigozhin swearing and shouting at um, at, at Shoigu and Gerasimov and, and what have you. So yeah, there's something moving in the Russian political and military political fields. So yeah, I think by this is all ahead of Tuesday's May the 9th. I think that I think there's a there's a lot of stuff happening that we're going to keep an eye on over the weekend. Thank you very much Francis and Dom Hamish to Breton Gordon. Can I come to you last as our guest? Great. Thanks very much and just I think next week hugely significant even more than usual as we've mentioned the 9th of May and also the 10th with potentially Wagner Group um, doing a runner and what that could create. And just one final thing, if I, if I may plug the Chalk Valley History Festival. We mentioned Mike Martin, he and I are doing a turn on Wednesday the 26th. So if anybody's going to the Chalk Valley Has- History Festival, come and say hi and listen to us and give us your views. Have a great coronation weekend, everybody. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells, Tassie Heslop and Giles Gear. And today on Twitter, Claire Hubble. <laughs>